So I'd like to introduce to you today our presenters. Dr. Alan Kaplan is a research engineer at the laboratory who got his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. And Kathy Huang, who is a biology teacher at Darty Valley High School in San Ramon, and she got her undergraduate degree at UCLA and a master's from UC Irvine. So with that, let's get started. Thank you, Joanna, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming today, for taking time out of your Saturday to be here. Um, I got my start in computers, I must have been in third or fourth grade, I think, when my family got our first computer at home. I learned to program it. <clears throat> I tried programming various things, including games. Um, and I was fascinated by the idea that one machine can do so many different things. Today, as a computer scientist, I think about how we can use computers, including some of the largest and fastest computers in the world, to understand the world around us better. Today, I'm going to be talking specifically about how we can use computers to better understand the brain. We'll learn what the brain does and a little bit about what the brain is made up of. We'll also talk about computers. This is a picture of one of the largest computer, fast, and fastest computers in the world at Lawrence Livermore. This computer takes up an entire large room. Each of these cabinets here has shelves with the various computer components inside of it. Well, we want to use the computer to learn about how the brain works. The first thing we have to do is represent the brain in a way that the computer can understand it. We have to put the brain inside the computer. So we're going to talk about uh, how we could do that and then use the computer to learn more about how the brain works. First, let's talk about computers. Computers are binary machines. Binary means two. The data inside of a computer are represented in binary digits or bits, which will we'll, uh, display as zeros and ones. So for example, if you take a picture of your cat, that has to be represented in terms of a sequence of zeros and ones inside the computer. Any of the complicated things that you then do with this image, like apply a filter to it or change the brightness, is broken down into very simple operations on these zeros and ones. And we'll be talking about a unit uh, called a byte, which is equal to eight bits. So here you can see the sequence of bits broken down into blocks of eight. OK, now back to our original question. We want to use computers to understand the brain. Now, why would we do this? Well, as hopefully you'll see in my presentation, the brain is immensely complex. And we really do need computers to help us understand how it works. And perhaps more importantly, we could use computers to develop technologies that improve patient outcomes for those patients who are afflicted with brain disorders. Now let's talk about the brain. The brain is the control center of the nervous system. So in this fictional, futuristic image, <clears throat> you can imagine data coming into this one room from every point on the globe, from different satellites, and being displayed on the screens. Then the people in this room have to look at all those data and make decisions about what to do. Do I launch another satellite? Do I change the position of the space station, et cetera? This is the same thing that the brain is doing in your body. In this picture, the blue lines represent nerves in the peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> and they are connected to almost every point on the body. They measure signals that are originating from the body and they're transmitted to the central nervous system, which consists of the spinal cord and the brain, those signals go up to the brain, providing the brain with information about the body. Then the brain makes decisions on the basis of that information and sends signals back to the body. So for example, if you touch your finger onto a hot stove, what happens is the nerves in your finger will sense the heat and that information will travel to the brain. Your brain will process that information. You'll decide to move your arm away from the stove. 
which then sends a signal back to the muscles in your arm to contract them, which then moves your finger away from the stove. Your finger will not move away from that hot plate until that signal goes up to the brain and back, hopefully fast enough before you get hurt. Uh, the brain also controls organs in your body without you even knowing about it. This is called the autonomic nervous system. So for example, breathing is controlled for you by your brain. You can consciously hold your breath or take a deep breath as well, but the regular operation of breathing is done automatically by the brain. The heart can actually beat entirely on its own without the brain, but the brain helps regulate it through times such as exercise or other times when you need to beat faster. Uh, the brain also controls the digestive system. But what's inside of the brain? There are many different objects, cells inside the brain. The one we're going to talk about primarily today is called the neuron, which you may have heard about before. This is a cartoon depiction of what a neuron looks like. It has a cell body, and just like every other neuron, uh, just like every other cell, rather, it has a nucleus which contains the genetic information. Attached to the cell body are these tree-like structures called dendrites. Dendrites are the inputs to the neurons. Other neurons connect to this neuron through the dendrites. There's a tail-like structure called an axon. This neuron, under certain conditions, which we'll talk about later, can send a signal, a message, down the neuron into the axon terminal. These axon terminals are connected to the dendrites of other neurons. And now I'd like to ask Kathy to come up on the stage and show us an actual brain. Hi, everyone. So since Science on Saturday is focusing on the brain, I thought I'd give you a chance to see what an actual brain looks like and look at brain tissue. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a real human brain, but I do have a model here. And I just want you to notice that for every structure that we have in the brain, I want you to think about its function. Uh, notice that on the human brain, there are lots of ridges and grooves on the surface. And this really allows for um, the fine motor movements that we're able to do. Uh, humans are able to read, write, speak. And the just sheer size of the cerebrum kind of allows for that kind of function. Now, this specimen I have right here is a sheep's brain. And scientists often compare human brains with other organisms to learn more about how our brain works. So this brain actually is still kind of intact. There are a lot of structures that are similar to the human brain, but not exactly the same. So notice that this brain right here, the ridges aren't as uh, clear. And notice that the sheep actually have their eyes on the side of their heads, and it's depicted right underneath the, the um, brain tissue. In the front, we also have the nose. And I thought this was something interesting for you guys to look at. Now let's say I took this brain and I cut it in half. And there are some major differences between our brain and the sheep's brain. So our brain, if you notice, we stand upright and our spinal cord is in a vertical position. So our brain stem goes up and down. But if you take a look at the sheep's brain, and again, let me be careful here, notice that the brain stem runs horizontally. And that's because sheep stand on four legs, their spinal cord's in the horizontal position. Um, and again, notice, let me just turn this around here, their cerebrum does not take up as much space proportional to its size. Uh, a human can be up to 150 pounds, so can a sheep. But notice the sheer size difference. Um, this can fit in the palm of my hand, whereas this is a lot bigger. Um, one structure that's a little bit, uh, mu actually much bigger in the sheep, but really small in the human, is its olfactory nerve. And olfactory is used for smell. So sheep have really tremendous ability to, to smell and distinguish scents, whereas humans don't really have that capability. Okay. All right, so humans, um, not humans, scientists, study a lot of different types of brain tissue in order to better understand how our brain works. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Kathy. So we're gonna talk more about the brain. Go ahead, you can clap. Yeah.
we're going to talk more about the brain. And we're going to divide the discussion in two parts, into structure and the function of the brain. So I want to start with an analogy. And that is the interstate system, or roadways, is depicted on the map on the left of roughly northern California. So the structure of the interstate system is the location of all of the highways and which highways they're connected to. If you, if you want to go to Sacramento to visit your sister and you start here, you know that you have to go 580 east to 5 north. You know that because you know the structure of the interstate system. The function of the roadway is the traffic at any given point in time, which is depicted by the figure on the right. So red means more traffic. You can see the terrible traffic conditions in the Bay Area. Now, the function can change quickly over time, although it doesn't feel that way when you're stuck in traffic, but it's true, whereas the structure can't change. Or if it does change, it takes a longer, longer time. It takes a long time to build a new road. Another analogy is an electronic circuit, like the one inside of a computer. The image on the left is showing a circuit board. And the structure is the positioning of the various electronic components, like the transistors and the diodes, and the tiny wires or traces that connect those components. The function of a circuit at any point in time are all the voltage levels or currents that are flowing through that circuit. Or if it's in a computer, those are represented as the ones and zeros flowing throughout that circuit over time. In the brain, the image on the bottom left is called an electron micrograph. We'll talk more about this uh, later, but this is essentially uh, similar to a microscope, but it enables you to see much smaller objects. This is an electron micrograph of a piece of a brain, where you can see the individual neurons in cells. So the structure of the brain is, is the positioning of the neurons and how they're connected to each other. Whereas the function of the brain, which changes over time as you're thinking, as you're watching me speak in this presentation and thinking about it, is the activity of those neurons. Which neurons are communicating with other neurons? And we'll be talking about that later as well. So I'm going to start with structure. So as I said, the structure of the brain is the way in which the neurons are connected to each other, the particular pattern of connections that those neurons uh, are inside the brain. And it's this particular pattern of connections of such a large number of neurons that is important for us to, to understand how the brain works. There's a word for it. It's called the connectome. So the connectome is a complete mapping or an, uh, a wiring diagram of all of the neurons in the brain. The ultimate goal of connectomic analysis would be to uncover or to find the exact connection or map of the brain in terms of which neurons are connected to which other neurons. The question is, can we uncover the connectome? Can we figure out what it is? The answer is that it's actually been done for one organism. In 1986, J.G. White, uh, in a major scientific advance, mapped out every single neuron of a tiny worm called C. elegans. We know how all 302 neurons of this worm are positioned and connected to each other. This is a, a, a computer model that shows uh, how those neurons are connected to each other. But I'm going to ask Kathy to come back and show us these worms. C. elegans, as you guys know, are a worm. But has anyone here seen a C. elegans before? Clap if you've seen one before. OK, a couple of you guys. <laughs> so this is exciting for you, because this is your first time seeing an actual C. elegans. All right. Now, C. elegans are worms that naturally live in the soil. And they're really easy to take care of in the lab. So let me get set up real quick. They are so small that it requires a microscope to actually view them. OK. Let me turn on the light here. Let me focus. All right. Oh, give me one sec. Let me rotate here. Okay. Here. 
anything? There you are. All right. Let me move to an area where there's a lot of C. elegans. Okay, so let's just watch their movement for a moment. Um, as you guys know, all the neurons in this organism have already been mapped out. And there's a lot of different studies utilizing these C. elegans to learn about uh, human behavior, how medications work, and how the environment affects uh, neurons. Uh, as you can see in this picture, which is a camera in the microscope, we can see different types of C. elegans at different stages in their life. The little circles that you see are actually eggs. Um, the big, huge ones are the parents. Um, there's uh, male and female and her hermaphroditic ones. And then the medium ones are kind of the larval stage. And you can see that they move pretty S-shaped. And we can do a lot of different tests on them because there are a lot of different mutations found in the C. elegans genome. So we're going to try something real quick. Um, they're pretty calm and uh, you know, pretty happy right now because they're kind of surrounded by food. But I'm just going to add a drop of water just to see what happens to their behavior here. Okay. So. All right. And let me find a spot where there's lots of them. Let me move up a little bit. Oops. All right. One drop. And now they're really moving around. All right. <laughs> you guys all see that? The large ones aren't phased by it, but it looks like the little ones are definitely phased by it. Now, they're really easy to take care of because all they eat is E. coli. And it only takes three days for them to reach maturity. So the C. elegans really is an ideal organism in order to learn about the nervous system. Okay. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. <clears throat> so what we'd like to do is move beyond the worm <clears throat> and, move and try to map out what the neural connections are for higher level organisms that have millions, or even like the human who has approximately 86 billion neurons in the brain. But if we want to compute the connectome, we can't do so in a manual process. Right? We need some way of doing it at a much larger scale than that of the worm. Uh, so we're going to watch a short clip in a couple minutes about uh, a group who has done this for a small piece of a rat brain. But just to, to get us there, the idea is similar. And this is an analogy to taking some landscape. Okay, so here on the image on the left, there's some mountains, a lake. And we want to build a computer model of this landscape. We want to know the height at any point. So you could imagine, hypothetically, slicing the mountains parallel to the ground, and then picking up each slice and stacking them on top of each other. So in the video that I'm going to show now, the researchers took a small piece of, of a rat brain and sliced it into very thin slices and imaged them with an electron microscope. They then took those slices and stacked them on top of each other and traced where the neurons are in space as they move through these slices. So let's go to YouTube and watch this video. Here we're zooming in on the electron micrograph. Like 
So all of that in an area smaller than a dust mite. In such a small area, I want you to appreciate the complexity of what's going on in the brain, how many different neurons are intersecting at such a tiny little point, tiny, tiny little volume. And so this gives you an idea of what the structure of the brain looks like. Now, I want to think hypothetically about what if we were to use this technique to construct a full model of a human brain. But just to lower your expectations, we haven't done it, and no one's done it. But I just want to think about what it would actually take to do it, just to get a sense for how big, how large the brain is. So we'll start with dimensions. A brain is roughly a, a cube of 10 centimeters on the side. It's not exactly right. It's actually longer from front to back, but this is fine for, for our approximation. We're then going to take the brain and slice it into very thin slices and take our electron micrograph. So each slice is going to be about 10 by 10 centimeters. That's also not exactly true, because as we move towards the edge of the brain, the slices will get smaller and smaller. But we'll approximate each one as being 10 by 10 centimeters. And the resulting image is just like the cat image that you saw before. It's just much, much larger. It's made up of pixels, just like the cat image. But what we want to understand is how many pixels are going to go into this image, this micrograph uh, image of one slice of a human brain. Well, to do that, we need to know how big each pixel is. And if the pixel is 30 nanometers, or a nanometer is a billionth of a meter on a side, then that's small enough. That's a sufficient resolution for us to be able to see the neurons and the connections between the neurons. So this is enough information to figure out how many pixels are in the image. Let's think about one row of pixels. So this is the equation that tells us how to do this. Essentially, we need to take the length of that row, which is 10 centimeters, and divide it by 30 nanometers. And that will tell us how many pixels are along that row. So let's take, and then we have to convert the units. So let's take 10 centimeters. There's 100 centimeters in a meter. Here we're dividing it by the 30 nanometer pixel length. And there are a billion nanometers in a meter. That results in about 3 million pixels along a single row of this electron micrograph slice of the human brain. That's about as many pixels as the entire cat image. But now, we have the entire image. We have to square that. So we get 3 million squared pixels in this entire image. That's a lot of pixels. But we also have many slices. And each slice is 30 nanometers thick. And now we're not talking about pixels anymore, but we're talking about voxels, which is a volumetric pixel. Because now the entire brain is a volume of these electron micrographs stacked together. So how many voxels are in all of this data? Well, for the single image, it was three, about 3 million squared. In the full three-dimensional volume, it's about 3 million cubed, or a number that's approximately 36 with eight followed by 18 zeros. That's a huge number. If we assign a single byte to each of those voxels, we get 36 with 18 zeros at the end bytes, which is called 36 exabytes. Okay, what is an exabyte? Well, here's a table of uh, orders of magnitude. Each row contains 1,000 times more than the row above it. And this applies to any units, meters, kilometers, or anything. But we'll be talking about bytes. So 1,000 is a kilo, kilometer, kilogram. As we move down, we get into a million. It's one with six zeros at the end. The powers of 10 go down, go in, are increased by three at every row. A megabyte is about the size of the cat picture. A single picture occupies about a megabyte of space. A gigabyte is a single movie that you might store uh, on your laptop. Your laptop itself might occupy about a terabyte of space. If you use a supercomputer, such as the ones 
at Lawrence Livermore, you might hope to operate on petabytes of data. We're moving into the exascale, but not there yet. Uh, the single brain volume is in the exabyte range. So even if we could do this experiment, we would have nowhere to put all the data. So that gives you a sense for how large uh, the brain is and all the structure that's inside of it. OK, now let's talk about function. So remember, function is the activity of the neurons in the brain. We got a sense for what the structure looks like. But now remember that all of the neurons are actually talking to each other. Well, how does that work? Let's go back to our neuron picture. This is our neuron. And uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the axon um, is this, uh, this structure by which an electrical current or a signal can flow through it. But when, what is the behavior? What does this signal look like? Well, the interesting facet of this behavior is that it's an all or nothing behavior. Either there's no current on the axon or there is. It's binary. But when does a, when does a neuron decide to send a pulse, we'll call it a spike, down the axon? Well, the answer is when there's enough of a stimulus. What does that mean? Well, recall that this neuron is in this very complicated structure. And there are lots of other neurons that are connected to this one through its dendrites. Those neurons are sending signals or sending currents into this neuron that are accumulated in the cell body, and they're added up together. When that total current reaches a certain level, this cell will generate its own signal and send it down the axon and through its axon terminals to other neurons. Now, while we understand very well how a single neuron works, the truth is that when you put it together into a large collection, such as the number of neurons in the human brain, 86 billion, the behavior of that system becomes far too complicated for us to understand. However, we're going to look at a, a video clip right now of a, a research team that created a computer simulation of a large group of neurons. What they did is they simulated the connections of all of those neurons. They provided a stimulus to it to see what would happen as these signals propagate through the various neurons. So let's go to YouTube and watch this video clip. So here, in an individual piece of light, you're seeing a single uh, axon of a neuron. And the flashes will get brighter as more and more neurons are activating. So what I want you to see from that uh, video is, <laughs> thank you, it wasn't my work, but uh, is this sort of rhythmic or pulsating activity that is propagating through this column of simulated neurons. We'll come back to that later. Now we want to ask the question, what about recording this stream of activity? Now, this is even harder to do than the structure problem, because we don't even have a way of recording all of the neurons in the human brain. But what if we could? What if we could record all that? What is the data stream? How big, how many bytes are being generated by your brain at any point in time? Let's think about that. So here are the facts. Your uh, human brain has about 86 billion neurons. And we're, we're going to assume <clears throat> that each one of those spikes once approximately every 10 seconds. Some of them are, are spiking much faster and some much slower. But we'll approximate once every 10 seconds. OK, we have to go back to bits for a minute. And I want to ask a question. And that question is, how many combinations of two bits are there? Now, this seems like an abstract, unrelated question. But I promise this is intimately related with the question that I just asked. So how many combinations of two? If you have two bits, each one is either a 0 or 1, how many different ways are there of arranging two bits? 
And the answer is 4. It's 2 to the second power. So 2 times 2 is 4. And here are all the combinations, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So in other words, with 2 bits, you can represent four different possibilities. You have four labels that you can attach to four different things. What about 3 bits? How many combinations are there of 3 bits? Some of you are saying it. So the answer is 8. 2 to the third power. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. And here are all of them written down, everything from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. In other words, if I give you 3 bits, <clears throat> that gives you 8 labels. You can label 8 different things with 3 bits. But here's the question that's related to our problem. How many bits does it take to represent 86 billion possibilities? If I want to have 86 billion unique labels, how many bits do I need to have? This question is a little hard. Well, somebody said it. Uh, so let's think about this. If you have 36 bits, 2 to the 36th power, you have approximately 64 billion possibilities, 64 billion labels, which is not enough. We'll have about 20 billion labels left, uh, neurons left over without a label. With 37 bits, it's two times the previous one, so about 128 billion. That's more than 86, but that's fine. We'll have some labels left over, but at least each of our neurons gets a unique label. So the answer is 37. In other words, every time a neuron in the human brain spikes, it would take 37 bits to record which one spike, to uniquely identify it with this scheme. But we're also going to say that every time a neuron spikes, you need the 37 bits to record which one spiked, but you also need, we're going to say, 32 bits, that's four bytes of uh, what's called floating, precision, floating number precision, to record the time at which it spiked. So in other words, every time the neuron spikes, you need 37 plus 32, or 69 bits, to uniquely identify it and the time. With all that information, you can then play back an entire sequence of spiking neurons. So let's see what this looks like. This is an equation that would tell us how large the data stream is, the activity of the human brain under these assumptions. So for every second, we have 86 billion neurons. We just said it would take about 69 bits to record each time it spikes. It spikes once every 10 seconds, so 69 bits every 10 seconds, and then converting from bytes to bits, 8 bits in a byte gives us about 73 billion bytes per second. That's 73 gigabytes per second. Now, how large is that? Well, if you're streaming a movie, uh, that movie stream, it takes about 800 kilobytes per second. So in other words, the amount of information in, in your brain that we've just derived is equivalent to about 90,000 movies being played simultaneously in your brain. So your brain, right now as you're watching me, your brain is activating much more, so it's probably higher than this. But your stream, your, your, the amount of data coming out of your brain is equivalent to this many movies being played at the same time. So that gives you a, a sense for how large the brain is, how complicated it is, and how much activity is going on in the brain as it's receiving all this information from various parts of the body and as the control center is sending information back out to the body. But we can't do any of that. What we can do, though, is use sensors to record some of the activity of the brain. And that's a field called electrophysiology. So electrophysiology means recording electrical activity from the body. And so there are two techniques here uh, that I'm showing you. One is called EEG, or electroencephalography. And this is a basically a, a hat that you can wear that has uh, sensors on it. And what happens is the electrical activity of the brain actually generates electrical fields that propagate through the skull and can be picked up at very weak signals by these sensors. That generates about four gigabytes per day of data. 
And our collaboration uh, with the University of California, San Francisco, Edward Chang and his group, we are analyzing data from devices called ECOG, or it's called electrocorticography. And these devices are actually implanted on the surface of the brain. If you were here last week, you heard about how some of these technologies work. And this generates about 10 times as much data, about 35 gigabytes per day. It's an amazing opportunity that we have to actually get very high fidelity data uh, from living human patients. So the way this works, uh, the patients have intractable epilepsy, and they're awaiting surgery. So they're in a monitoring ward for about seven or 10 days at a time with the ECOG sensors implanted on their brains. So using the ECOG brain data, we're getting an idea of what the brain function is for a continuous 24-7 recording. Now, we focused our study on emotion and mood. We want to try to understand what the brain is doing under various emotional states of the patient. So we have a video camera positioned in the monitoring ward that is recording all of the activity, but we're interested in extracting the emotional state of the patient as represented by individual instances of laughing, crying, etc. Now let's talk a little bit about emotion and mood and why this is an important area to study. So, as I've already indicated, emotions are very short events. You could be afraid, sad, or happy, for example. But they originate in the brain as survival techniques. They're intimately connected with how we think and how we reason because they've been with humans for such a long time. So when you're afraid, that helps you get, uh, it helps you escape from danger. When you're sad, sadness helps with attachment and safety. When you're happy, it gives you an opportunity to rest. These are cues that your body gives you that indicate what you could be doing to escape potential danger. Mood, on the other hand, is a long-term state. Right? If you're in the same emotional state for long periods of time, you can enter into a mood. And if it happens too much, it can become a mood disorder. So if you're consistently afraid, that could develop into a phobia. If you're consistently sad, that could develop into a depression. Now, what could possibly be wrong with being happy all the time? Well, perhaps that's the basis for addiction, right? So at the risk of getting booed off the stage, when you play video games, which are actually designed to, to make you happy. So you play the game, it makes you happy, so you want to keep playing the game, and then you forget to do all the other things that you're supposed to do. Um, but it's important for us to try to understand what's going on in the brain during these emotional states. OK, so back to our problem. So we're recording data in the form of signals at these various locations. There's about 100 locations on the brain. And what's happening is, <clears throat> as I've alluded to before, each of these probes or sensors is recording an electric field that's generated inside the brain. When you have large populations of neurons, you may need millions of neurons to activate, to spike coherently. That signal is strong enough that can then be emanated outside of the brain and into these sensors. So I want you to think back to the previous video where you saw this brain activity and you saw there's sort of this wave-like behavior. So when the brain has this wave-like behavior, it, it generates a signal that we can measure. We can't measure the one-off neuron spikes that you saw in that simulation with this technique. It's just not strong enough, but we can measure this wave-like activity. And what we'd like to do is try to understand what these, the composition of those waves are in our signals and relate them back to the problem that we're interested in. So these waves can come in different forms. They could be slow, so you could have these pulsations that are occurring very slowly, or they can occur very quickly like as, they, as they propagate through the brain. 
every time you get this large wave-like behavior, we're measuring that information. These are called frequencies if you talk about this in terms of signals. So going from low frequencies, where the distance between the peaks of these waves is large, or high frequencies, where the distance between those peaks is small, and everything in between. And we can measure that in the data that we collect. So using a technique called a Fourier decomposition, which was discovered by Joseph Fourier in the early 19th century, which is actually a technique that underlies many of our technologies today, we can take our signals and we can break them down into these different frequencies. We can understand and compute how much of each frequency this signal contains. And that's represented in this bar graph on the bottom. So maybe there's a lot of a low frequency and maybe not as much of a high frequency, et cetera. So what we're trying to discover is what are the frequencies present during different emotional states when someone is happy or sad, are things oscillating at a high rate, at a low rate? And this also depends on the positioning and where in the brain we're recording from. So we'll talk about emotional frequencies. Frequencies aren't actually emotional. That's a joke. Uh, frequencies are what they are. But uh, we want to, again, our point is we want to see how we can translate the sad or happy events into frequencies. So we use the video camera to isolate events or points in time when our patient is happy. And we can extract signals that we're recording during those times. We can then take those signals and come up with our happy frequencies, or the frequencies and the amounts of each of the frequencies that are occurring when the patients are happy. We can do the same thing when the patient's sad. And you can see that what we're looking for is perhaps there are, cer there are certain frequencies that are occurring at a much higher level when you're happy versus you're sad or vice versa. And then we can use this to create a happier sad scale. We can use a model like this to try to determine what the emotional state is of the patient using their brain information alone. Can we tell if they're happy or sad only using the ECOG measurements? So the way this works is we take a new signal, we compare it to the two models. So we look at the frequency contents of that new signal, and we see how they compare to the happy or sad models. Which frequencies do they have that the happy model says you should have when you're happy? Which frequencies does it have that the sad model says you should have when you're sad? And we can combine those to create a scale. We get a number. We can quantify how happy or sad this patient is on the basis of the ECOG data. We can then validate our results. We can look at a patient's data and try to predict, is the patient happy or sad? And we can validate that using the video camera. And we can point out the locations on the brain where we do a good job of predicting whether they're happy or sad, or whether we don't do as good of a job predicting their emotional state. So this figure is showing you a 3D model of a patient's brain. And each dot on this figure is a location of a sensor. And the color coding is telling us how well our model is distinguishing between happy and sad. You can see the blue or purple areas where the model's not doing as good of a job, and the green and yellow areas where the model's doing a better job at this. This gives us an indication, using this model, of where the emotional processing might be occurring in this patient. This can help in terms of monitoring the emotional health of the patient uh, through his or her stay. It can help with planning the surgery that's going to happen after their stay. But we can also use the data from these patients to try to understand emotion generally in the brain and how it connects to the way in which the brain works. So to wrap up, the points that I want uh, you to, to come away with are that the brain is complex. I hope you saw how large it is and how much, how hard it would be to actually measure everything that's happening inside of the brain. Another point is that the brain is, because the brain is so complex, we need computers to help us understand it. 
to help us uncover how it works. Through this research, we're hoping to gain new insight into how mood operates and how it changes over time. And ultimately, the goal is to help patients uh, that are affected by a mood disorder or otherwise uh, in the hospital setting. I'd like to thank you uh, for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.